Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to see you all worship this morning on this bright sunny morning, although I think the sun disappeared behind the clouds there. <laughs> so you're, you're all very welcome. Can I welcome anybody who are worshiping with us, who are visiting with us um, for the first time, or you're with us all the time, or you join us online, you're all very welcome, and we look forward to joining with us for worship today. And so can I also welcome on your behalf Reverend Peter Bovo to worship who lead our worship this morning. Peter is our new convener of our vacancy and is the minister in Ida McGee Presbyterian Church. I got it right, so and so Peter, we look forward to you leading our worship and look forward to getting to know you better so we are. So uh, we look forward to you leading us to worship today. And so I remember my glasses today. There will be refreshments after the service in the welcome area, so too, do please join us for a time of fellowship and friendship after the service. Can I also remind members of Kirk Session there will be a brief meeting immediately after the service in one of the, I think it's going to be the uh, Brown Memorial Hall. It depends, so you'll find it where we are. And so if you require the services of a minister, please contact myself in the first instance or your district elder. There will be one home group meeting this week. The home group led by Alec will meet this coming Tuesday from half past seven in the home of Lex in Heaven. We meet again for prayer on Saturday morning upstairs in the Bradley room from 10 o'clock and we do invite you all to come and, and join with us in this time of prayer. Can I remind you of the announcement Lex made last week for Scripture Union as your move? As Lex said, this is a little book that the Kirk Session agreed to uh, give to you all year sevens in Whitehead Primary School this year, moving to secondary school education in September. And so if you'd like to be part of this, please, and donate to this, the envelopes will be provided in the vestibule or here at the front after the service. Articles for the next edition of the Contact Magazine are to be with Helen Graham no later than next Sunday, the 5th of May at the latest. And so next Sunday, the 5th of May, we meet again here for worship at 11 o'clock and our service will be led by the Reverend John Woodside. So these are all the announcements and can I hand over now to the choir who will lead us in the intro, right? lead me Lord. Together, let's pray. Father, as we have just listened in song, Father, we pray that you would indeed lead us in your righteousness today. Father, that you would draw us closer to you, that you would open our eyes to see the wonder and majesty and awesomeness of who you are. 
And Father, that after we spend time in worship together as your people in this place, Father, that we would leave knowing you leading us and guiding us, your presence with us, you going with us. And so, Father, we just commit our time to you, that you would come and through your spirit draw us closer to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to call us to worship today using some words from Psalm 93. I'm going to read them. You can follow on the screen. And then we're going to stand and sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty. But Psalm 93. The Lord is King. He is robed in majesty. Indeed, the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Your throne, O Lord, has stood from time immemorial. You yourself are from everlasting past. The floods have risen up, O Lord. The floods have roared like thunder. The floods have lifted their pounding waves. But mightier than the violent raging of the seas, mightier than the breakers on the shore, the Lord above is mightier than these. Your royal laws cannot be changed your reign, O Lord, is holy forever and ever. This is the God that we come to worship and sing and hear from this morning. We're going to sing together. And if you can, please stand. We're going to sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Almighty God, we come before you now in prayer and praise and declare that you are the one and only God of this world. You're the God who created this world, sustains each and every part of it. You're the God who's continually involved in people's lives, in our lives, working in your plans and your purposes. You're the sovereign God who reigns. 
And yet even though you reign and rule, you are also the God who comes close, who shields us, who shelters us in times of trouble. Father, may we respond in praise and worship to you, our gracious God. Mm. And Father, we pray for ourselves, we pray that our lives would recognise your kingship. Mm. That it would be clear in our lives who reigns over our lives, directing us and guiding us and shaping us. Father, that we would look to your word. Father, that you would humble us before your throne of grace. And that we would need, see our need for Jesus. And Lord, we come in confession and repentance before you today. Lord, we recognise the wrong thoughts, the words, the deeds that we have done. We recognise that our sin is against you and only you. And so, Father, through G Jesus and the cross, we pray, Father, that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us, that you would wash us as white as snow that you'd be doing a work in us, creating in us a new heart, making us more like Jesus. And so, Father, as we continue in our time of worship today, Father, may our hearts and our lives overflow in praise to you, our, our great God, who through Christ has granted us salvation, who brings peace and hope into our lives. He makes it possible for us to say that you are our Father. And so we pray together using the words that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It is great to be here with you this morning. Thanks to Warren for his warm welcome and introduction. As Warren said, I look forward to getting to know you all over the coming months maybe even years, um, but yes, it's, it's just wonderful to be here this morning to lead you in worship and begin a, a journey together as churches in the local area. We'll come back and think about that a little bit later on, but I do look forward to getting to know you all in the coming days. This morning, um, we're beginning a, a series when I come and join you probably every four to six weeks. Unfortunately, you'll have to look at my face. But that will probably be the, the routine over the next um, while, every four to six weeks I'll be coming here. We're going to begin a little series through the book of Daniel. And today we're thinking about Daniel 1. But I want to suppose introduce that before we hear from God's word by just thinking about trust. And the element of trusting in God. Why should we trust in God? Little, well, I was about to say, maybe there were young people or children here this morning to, to learn a memory verse, but I don't believe it. It's, it's never, you're never too old to learn a memory verse. But Proverbs 3 tells us this trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Before we think about God, the great sovereign ruling God, we want to just have that thought in our mind about trusting that God. Each day we trust many, many things and we do that without even thinking about it. Get into your car, you turn it on, you drive down the road, you're trusting that the wheels won't fall off your car. You go to the dentist, you trust the dentists, the doctors, the pilots in the plane, the, the captains of the boat. We trust many different things, the seats that we sit on. I don't know um, if you've ever seen or been part of a, a trust fall. I was in Ian McGee Primary School on, on Friday and we were thinking about putting our faith in God and I asked one of the kids if he trusted me 
And he came up to the front and I asked him to turn away from me and fall back into my arms to trust me. He then decided he didn't trust me anymore and went back down. But I got another kid up who knew me and he did trust me and he fell back in. Now I'm not saying we're going to do that before. I don't think Warren would want me to do that with him this morning. But that idea of trusting or putting our lives into someone else's hands, into God's hands. Why should we trust God? Why should we not just depend on ourselves? Well, this morning we're going to hear about a God in whom we can trust, because he's the sovereign ruling God. And not only that, but he's the God who loves us. And just before Wendy comes and reads to us from, from Daniel chapter 1, I just want to maybe introduce our reading today. As I said, over the coming months we're going to be journeying, beginning a journey through the, the book of Daniel. And maybe if you get time in your own quiet times or whatever, to begin to read through the book um, maybe, yeah, a couple of chapters a week, familiar yourself just with a section of God's word. But suppose as we begin to think about this, I want us to think that all is not as it seems, looking in from the outside. All is not as it seems, looking in from the outside. And that is true, I don't know if you recognise that wardrobe. It's a famous wardrobe from C.S. Lewis's, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. And for Edmund, as he saw a hiding place, as he played hide and seek with his siblings, all he saw was a great place to hide. No one would find him in there. But little did he know that as he opened the door, as he stepped inside, as he pushed back to hide behind the coats, he would find him in a place where it's always winter and never summer. Oh, was not as it seems, looking in from the outside. And we're going to hear Daniel chapter 1 read to us. We're going to look in from the outside at the events of history as they're described to us. But I want to encourage you to ask that question. Is all as it seems, looking in from the outside of this story. So I'd love you to turn to Daniel chapter 1 in your Pew Bibles. It is on page 883. Thank you, Wendy. 883. It is quite um, a little bit longer bit of a reading, so it's maybe helpful to, to open up your pew Bibles to follow along. But we're going to hear um, Daniel chapter 1, page 803, and Wendy's going to come and read God's word to us today. Thanks for having me. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, king of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel the name, 
Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. My God had caused the official to show favour and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men of your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So we agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Thank you. Well, do keep your Bibles open. We're going to turn to those verses in just a short um, time after we stand to sing. My hope is built on, on nothing less than the song Quarterstone. Let's sing together. <laughs> Thank you. 
some time now to look at Daniel 1 together. Um, I'm going to turn back there, please do, PG 83 of your Pew Bible. But before we do that, let's just pray and ask God's help as we turn to his word this morning. Let's pray <coughs> together. <coughs> Father, as we come to your word, we ask, Father, that you would give us a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of revelation and the knowledge of Christ. Father, so that the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened. So that we might know the hope that you have called us to, that we might know you better. And so, Father, now as we hear your word, fill us with your spirit. Soften our hearts, sharpen our minds, shape our wills, and draw us closer to you. I'm more like Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It matters who is in charge. It matters who is in charge. I think that's a message that I've been getting. I think you may have been getting over these last weeks and months as we listen to the radio, as we watch the TV news bulletins. It matters who's in charge. Because as we listen to the news, we hear report and report about elections, about political leadership this past week. It's been from Scotland and the leadership of Humza Isaf here in Northern Ireland. We've just had a number of years of political turmoil and just then when things seem to be settling down, party leaders were back in the news. We're already starting talking about American elections and they're in November. Just the amount of time and attention tells us that it matters who's in charge. And this is important. It really does matter who is in charge. It affects our lives in many different ways, especially in these last turbulent years of COVID and the cost of living crisis and the pressures on our health service and education services. It matters who's in charge. And the book of Daniel is about who is in charge. But not in Westminster or Washington or Edinburgh or Belfast, not in Babylon either. But who is in charge over the whole world? The entire universe. Who is really the king of kings? And this also really matters. This matters to each of us in our daily lives, especially when we're facing maybe more difficult times. It matters who is in charge when we're facing personal uncertainty, when we're waiting for an operation, when we're worried about our families, when we're not sure what the future looks like for our church congregations, when we're coping with difficult health diagnosis and so many different varied situations in our everyday and personal lives, it really does matter who we believe to be in charge. And my hope, my hope and prayer is that as we journey through the book of Daniel, you will see so clearly and so powerfully that it is God who is in charge, that it is God who is king. So just what is going on here in Daniel 1? If we go back to our illustration from C.S. Lewis's wardrobe, and oh, as we look in from the outside, 
is all as it really seemed. We're parachuted into the historical setting of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. It's a disaster for King Jehoiakim and his people, God's people, as Jerusalem is besieged and then defeated. Articles from God's temple are carried off to a temple in Babylon. It's a way of showing that their God has been defeated. And then it's the brain drain is ordered as Jerusalem's brightest and best are carried off to begin their cultural assimilation in Babylon. And when you look in from the outside, it looks very much like God and his people are defeated. They are down and out. However, as we know only too well, outward appearances don't always tell the full story. And so as we begin the book of Daniel, considering one of the great themes of the book, a theme that's going to return again and again, and a thing that can be hard to, to grapple with in God's word, but it's a real trip that brings peace and comfort to our soul. <coughs> We're going to be thinking again how God is king, how God is sovereign, how God is in control, how God reigns. As we look in from the outside, all is not as it seems from a first reading, that God is still king. And there are three markers here in Daniel chapter 1, the start, the middle and the end, in which the passage shouts loudly to us about what is really going on, about who really is king, about who reigns in this story. In verse 1, if you have your Bibles, you can see in verse 1, it's the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah. In verse 9, it's God who causes the official to show favour to Daniel. In verse 17, it's God who gave knowledge and understanding to these four young men. Moving through this chapter, we see God as king. All that we read happening through this chapter, throughout this book, and to take it even further, further throughout scripture and history, is under the reign and rule of God. God is sovereign. And here in Daniel 1, God is not defeated. God is bringing about his purposes. It doesn't say specifically here in Daniel 1, but God is actually bringing punishment upon his people for their disobedience and their rejection of him. They've broken their covenant promises with God, and God had always said there would be consequences to that. And these consequences have already been spoken of by the prophet Jeremiah. They're no surprise. And here God comes and brings defeat for his people and victory for his enemies. The Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hands. God is king. God is sovereign. God is in control. God reigns. And there are two, I suppose, important points to consider as we think of God's sovereignty, God's reign as king. And the first is this. In all that God does, we need to remember that he cannot act against his own nature. God cannot sin. God remains faithful to his nature, a nature of perfection, of wisdom, of justice, of love, and all that he does, God cannot act against his own nature and his rule and reign. And then secondly, the Bible also teaches us about ourselves, that each of us are responsible for our own actions and the lives that we live. God controls what happens as king, but that doesn't violate our free will. And those two things can be hard to get our heads around, hard to reconcile, hard to grasp. But in the Bible, we're called to trust. Trust God in our lives to hold these two things in tension, God's sovereignty and our responsibility. And we see these two truths woven throughout Scripture in a really well-known story of Joseph. We read this from Genesis 50. But Joseph said to them, that's his brother, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. 
As Jesus speaks to his brothers, he reminds them of what they intended to do, their responsibility, but then speaks of God's intention. In Proverbs 16, we read this, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. God's sovereignty, our responsibility. So as we grapple with that, as we try and get our heads around it, it's a truth that runs through Scripture. God is still King. And that truth that God is King, it can be a great source of comfort and strength for all who trust in Him. Because in each of our lives, it matters who is in charge. And God is in charge. The God who loves us in Christ is in charge and we can trust him. And that means that no matter what we are going through in life, we can know that God is at work in the midst of it. And we may not see that, and we may struggle to believe it sometimes, we may even question God's wisdom and ways. But God is still sovereign. God is king. Nothing can stand in God's ways. Nothing can frustrate him or stop him. And that means when it comes to our salvation in Christ and God's eternal purposes of rescue, nothing can or will stop him. Our salvation is secure. Heaven is our sure and certain hope. God will carry us through our time here on earth and nothing will ever and nothing can ever separate us from God's love for you in Christ. God is king. God is sovereign. God is in control. God reigns. And as Paul writes in Romans 8, I am convinced that nothing, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God will hold us fast because our Saviour loves us. In the coming weeks as we journey through this book of Daniel, we're going to hear much about Daniel and his friends. We're going to hear about their relationship with God, about their life in Babylon. We'll learn much about what it means to live for God in a foreign land. And for each of us, I think we have lots to learn about what it means to live faithfully for God in a world that doesn't care for God in a world that has rejected him and sees no place for God's rule and reign. And that's the world in which the Babylonians wanted to immerse Daniel and his friend. And in verses 3 to 5, we read of project assimilation. The king's goal is to integrate and incorporate the brightest and best of Jerusalem into the culture, into the life of Babylon, so that they would forget everything that they had come from. They would be immersed in this new culture. And so he changed their names. And we might not think that to be too much of a big deal, but when your name had a deep meaning related to your faith, this was a big deal. Daniel meant God is my judge. And now he was to be known as Belteshazzar, may a God protect his life. Their names were changed. They had to learn a new language, read from Babylonian literature. They were given food and wine from the king's table, trained to enter the king's service. And what we learn from these events in Daniel are things that we can seek to help us to live faithfully and trust wholeheartedly in a world that has rejected God. So I want to just leave you with an encouragement, a challenge, as we reflect on what we can learn from Daniel in this opening chapter. I think the first thing that I want to leave with you is that we need wisdom. 
We need God's wisdom. And I want to encourage you to seek that and pray for that. I think we see godly wisdom here in the life of Daniel as he's confronted with this cultural assimilation, this attack on all that he has known, this desire to change him into someone unrecognizable to what he was. And in this chapter, we see God's hands at work. We see Daniel's wisdom from God. And no doubt there could be many other things he could have objected to, but it was the food that they were being given that he sought to change. And interestingly, it was not all the food. It was just the vegetables, because the vegetables still came from the king's table. But Daniel and his friends, in the midst of this amazing change and challenge of what they faced, sought to show faithfulness and trust in God. And so as they were faced with the lure of the new society with all its bright lights and possibilities, they sought to continue to trust in God. As they were bombarded with teaching and language and culture so opposed to God, they asked themselves the question, how can they show faithfulness and trust in God. And in God's wisdom, they chose to do that through the food they ate each day. And so as they ate the vegetables, they trusted that God would bless them. That in physical terms, their appearance would not be affected. That as they learnt that they would grow in wisdom, and they daily trusted God as they ate their vegetables at each mealtime. And I have a picture of them sitting down with all that they've been learning buzzing around in their minds. But before they ate the veg vegetables that they committed themselves to, they also committed themselves again to God. That they showed a faithfulness and a trust in God. And that faithfulness and trust in God will be displayed in really huge, more bigger public ways in the coming chapters, familiar stories that we have heard before. But for now in chapter one, we see a faithfulness and trust in God that God blessed. Because initially after 10 days in verse 15, we read this, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. And so as they had sought to show faithfulness to God, as they sought to trust God, God blessed them. And it was a huge reminder that God was with them. That God was faithful to them as they sought to be faithful to him. And as they continued to eat vegetables to God's glory for the next three years. So at the end of those three years, Daniel and his friends once again were reminded that God was with them that God honoured their faithfulness because in verse 19, the king found none equal to them. And so as we reflect on Daniel and his friends and how they showed faithfulness and trust in God, how do we show our faithfulness and trust in God just in the everyday situations of our lives? How do we, in some way, like Daniel and his friends, draw a line in the sand over which we will not cross in order that we might be truly faithful to God. There's potentially a line in the sand that shows that we are trusting in God alone, that our faith is in Jesus, that our desire is to be obedient to God above everything else. Marks in our lives that show the world around us, to our family and our friends, our work colleagues, our neighbours, that we are following Jesus. And there can be many different things that we in God's strength choose to do and ultimately we need God's wisdom to know what we might do in our own individual lives and contexts. But maybe it involves our workplaces. Maybe it involving avoiding chat around the water cooler that you find is just primarily about gossiping about others. Avoiding that, drawing a line in the sign, you're not going to get involved in that. Maybe it could be about decisions, about how we use our time and our money that means that our lives look different 
from the world around us. We've drawn a line. We're going to act differently in relation to our time and our money. It could be choices that we make in more difficult times of our lives that show that we are trusting in God, very actively, visibly showing in difficult times that we are trusting in God. But whatever it is, we're seeking to follow Jesus faithfully and show a trust in God no matter what. I was praying that God would grant us the opportunity to share about what is motivating us in those decisions. When we draw that line and we're seen to be different, that we're praying for opportunities to share our hope as 1 Peter 3 encourages us, looking for opportunities in which we're always ready to give an answer to everyone who asks us to get the reason for the hope that we have, the hope that we have. And I don't know about you, but I need God's wisdom to know how I can best live faithfully, how I can best live showing a trust in God in a world that doesn't want to know God. And in James, as he writes to Christians facing the huge challenges of life in a secular society, James writes this, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Asking God for wisdom to know how we can show faithfulness and trust in our everyday lives, where we want to draw that line. And later in chapter 3, we have God's wisdom described for us in James 3, a wisdom that I believe we should be praying for, seeking after, a wisdom that we so desperately Need. And it's described in verse 17 in this way. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Wisdom on how we can follow in David, uh, Daniel, and his friends' footsteps and about living faithfully and trusting wholeheartedly each day. Now, as we continue to just think about that, we want to continue to respond and song and prayer, continue to think about some other aspects um, for the rest of our service. But firstly, we're going to stand and sing, He will hold me fast. Let's sing together.
we'll like, continue just for the next 10 minutes or so respond um, to what we've been thinking about God as King, as God as Sovereign, about what it means to live faithfully and trust wholeheartedly each day. I want to play a little video that is from Open Doors that um, seeks to support um, those um, of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted around the world. It's really helpful as we think about what it means to live faithfully and trust wholeheartedly that we think about those who are persecuted for their faith, about the challenge it is to live for Jesus in other parts of the world. So I'm hoping this video will, will work, thanks to Jason for helping me with this. It is in Vietnamese, which I'm not expecting you to understand, but there is some English subtitles that I hope are not too small. But they'll just give us a little bit of an insight on what it means to live faithfully and trust wholeheartedly in Christ um, in Vietnam um, today. Let's watch this video. Thanks, Jason. <coughs> chị um, thờ phượng chúa là thờ phượng chúa ở nhà thôi không không có nhà thờ gì cả cả người anh chị em ở trên đó là uh, tin chúa Thiên Chúa là họ bắt bớ, họ muốn cho vợ chồng bọn nhau và họ uh, muốn cho uh, không không cho vợ chồng ở với nhau. Nếu chồng không chịu bỏ uh, vợ thì uh, họ họ cắt mọi chế độ và nhà nước hỗ trợ cho uh, mọi anh chị em trên đó. chị không nghe lời của họ chị cũng uh, chị được ở là chị cũng uh, chia sẻ uh, tín linh cho mọi người khác bây giờ thì họ cũng chưa biết nhưng mà uh, cứ ý của chị là chị chỉ cứ uh, truyền cho họ biến nhiều hơn nữa cả người ở gần thì uh, chị đi bộ và chị uh, truyền uh, lúc ban đêm Lúc bà đến là chị uh, tới nhà họ để truyền cho họ là chị uh, truyền chị uh, ý của chị là chị truyền thế nào họ bắt đưa chị họ um, cho thì chị sống họ uh, giết thì chị chị uh, chết chị cũng nhìn như vậy trên là địa bàn của chị đó là um, đã được thờ phượng chùa với nhau là chị cảm thấy là um, đức chúa trời làm uh, công việc ở trên đó uh, mạnh mẽ hơn To read that and just get a gist of what it really means for people in different parts of the world to follow Jesus, the persecution very physically in their lives, the demands to not tell others about Jesus, what and the cost that it is. And so I want to pray for Christians in, in Vietnam this morning. I want to pray for ourselves, but we're also going to pray for Adam Creed this morning. A number of weeks ago, you had the joy of Adam joining with you all as a church family, being able to honour him and spend time together. But some of you already know, but since then, Adam has received some difficult news. After some initial investigation, a mass has been found in Adam's kidney. And so they're beginning a, a journey, a journey filled with decisions around treatment, maybe what the next steps might be. And so we want to pause and pray for Adam and Hannah and Ar Ariella and Elijah. And we want to commit them to the safekeeping of our Heavenly Father. And over the, the coming weeks and months, we'll endeavour to update you on 
on Adam's progress whenever we know more. But for now, we want to commit them to God in prayer. So we pray for ourselves, think about what it means to serve and follow um, wholeheartedly, to trust God in our everyday lives. To pray for Adam and Hannah and the family, and also for Christians in Vietnam this morning. Let's, let's pray together. Father, as we think about all these things, we thank you for that reminder that you are the perfect Father, that you are our Heavenly Father. We thank you for adopting us into your family, for freeing us from our slavery to sin, for giving us a spirit of sonship, of bringing us into your family. Father, promising that you've complete the work that you've begun in us and that work to transform us and make us more like Jesus. And Father, in our everyday lives, as we've thought about Daniel, Father, we want to think and pray for how we might live faithfully and trust wholeheartedly in you each day. And Father, for each of us, that is something different that will look different and father we want to pray father that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will through your wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives that you will show us very clearly the lines that we in the sand that we need to draw for how we can trust jesus more follow wholeheartedly mm -hmm. and father that you will be with us in our daily lives as we seek to do that but fathers, we are reminded this morning that you are king, that you are God, that you reign and rule. And that can be a difficult truth to grapple with, but it is an important truth when we are in the midst of difficult situations and receiving difficult news. And Father, especially this morning, we bring to you Adam. Father, in these days of just hearing the news and processing that news of visiting and uh, the hospitals of having appointments. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray for a real special awareness of your promises to them, that you never leave us, mm -hmm. that for them as a family, they'll be so aware of your special presence through your spirit, that in these first steps that you would grant great wisdom to those who seek to care for them. And Father, that you give them your peace that passes all understanding guarding our hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. And so, Father, we just leave them with you, Adam, Anna, Ariella, and Elijah. And, Father, we long for the day when there will be no more dementia or heart disease or cancer or respiratory issues, no more disease of any kind, the day of perfect health. And so, Father, we thank you for the promise of the resurrection body that will never get sick or wear out or die. We thank you that our life is secure and safe through Christ in the new heaven and the new earth. And we pray for healing for Adam today. Until that perfect day comes, Father, we pray for your hand upon him in a very special way. And Father, through the video this morning, we've been reminded just what it means to follow Jesus in different parts of the world. And so, Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Vietnam today. Father, we pray that you keep them strong in their faith, that you would help them as they face difficult challenges, that they would hold on to you and not lose faith. Father, you protect them from violence against them, um, from those who, who don't want them to follow Jesus. Father, we pray that you meet all their needs and heal all their heart. And Father, we pray that you would soften the hearts of local authorities so that believers will be able to build churches and worship openly. Father, we pray that you would encourage our Vietnamese brothers and sisters today and refresh their spirit. Father, we pray all these things for ourselves, for Adam and Hannah, for our brothers and sisters of Vietnam. We pray them all in Jesus' name, trusting in you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just at this point in our service, we're going to show our continued trust in God as we give our offerings and our money to the work of God in this place and around the world. If those um, collecting the offering could just maybe just leave the baskets at the front because I'm going to pray again and just update you with some other things as well. Thank you.
Yes, in the middle. Do you flick it to the front? Brilliant. Just as we close our service, um, I want to give you a little bit of an update um, just about life here in Whitehead Presbyterian Church. Some of the things coming in, in, the, in the coming months, and then we're praying and we're finish our service in, in song. As Warren was saying, I'm, I'm your new con convener, um, and together we're going to chart the, the journey into the coming months and years. I'm not exactly sure what has been shared, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about our, our, our plan as, as elders here in Whitehead in, in the coming months. Our hope in the coming months is that there will be, well there is, an agreement already for a new position here in Whitehead Presbyterian, the position of an auxiliary minister. And that may not have been a position that you've heard before. An auxiliary minister within the life of, of PCI, someone who's had um, training, training in preaching, leading services and some pastoral work. And the position of auxiliary minister here in Whitehead has been agreed centrally in PCI. And we're beginning a, a process of, of recruiting an auxiliary minister initially to come and take probably a couple of services a month and being involved in some pastoral care within the life of your congregation and, and church family. And we do hope that over the coming weeks and months that position will get filled and we'll keep you up to date um, with that. But we're, we're encouraged and excited about that role here in Whitehead. Alongside that, um, there will be at least one retired minister who's going to come and take a service once a month. That's John Woodside who's going to take your service next Sunday. John's going to take uh, the first service of every month for the foreseeable future. John served um, down in Kilkenny um, and in Drogheda mainly through his ministry. He's originally from Lawrence. Some of you may know John. He's retired, living outside Valley Clare, and he was very willing and looking forward to coming and joining you as a church family once a month and getting to know you. And so that's some of what um, we have hopefully in place over the coming months for when it comes to particularly Sunday morning ministry. And as the, the weeks pass, we'll keep you up, up to date with what is happening in relation to those things. I suppose that alongside life here specifically in Whitehead, you've over the last number of months sort of, of common ground, which I suppose is what we've, we've labelled the three local churches beginning to do more things together. Whitehead, Ballycarry and Isle McGee. And last week, Catherine was here telling you more about our, our summer week. And I just want to really encourage you about that, um, and particularly the need for your, your help. I particularly want to note the, the volunteer vision night on Monday the 13th of May at 7.30 up in Ballycarry. That's an opportunity for everyone from the three churches to come along, hear more about the plans for our summer week, and maybe choose an area in which you might like to get involved. So I really encourage you to note um, that. I do believe there's a sign up sheet, maybe not for that night, but for getting involved <coughs> in, in the week out in the vestibule. Please speak to Warren or myself if you want to find out more. But also, you'll, I hope you'll note that on Sunday the 19th of May, here in Whitehead, we're having a prayer and praise night. An opportunity for the three congregations to gather together to praise God together, but also pray specifically for our summer week. And I really encourage you to get involved in that. Alongside our summer week, we do hope that there will be other events under the Common Ground banner. Last year we were encouraged by women's events and men's events and youth events and other opportunities for the three congregations to work together. So I hope that they will be encouraged by that as well. And so that's just a little bit of an update on, on life um, in Whitehead Presbyterian Church. But I want to pray for you as a congregation um, and pray for your offering this morning. Then we'll close our service in, in song. Let me pray. Let me lead us in prayer. Father God, as we have reminded ourselves this morning, we thank you that you are God, you are King, that you reign and rule. And you have plans for each of our life, but also for the life of this church family. And so, Father, we want to commit to you the future plans for this auxiliary minister who hopefully in the, in the weeks and months will, will join this church family. Father, we pray for a real clear path forward for the elders, your clear leading to that individual. 
that you will lead us in now. Father, we want to pray for John Woodside as he comes to preach in this church family as well. We ask your blessing upon him as he joins once a month to minister to your people in this place. And Father, we want to pray for this church family, that their love for you would grow, that their love for each other would grow, that their love for this community in which you've placed them would grow, and that you would bless them. And Father, along with Bally Carrie and I McGee, that you would give these three church families an excitement, a passion for the Common Ground initiatives that are in this summer week of mission to children, young people and their families. And Father, that you would spur us to get involved in that. And Father, we want to thank you for the offering that is before us this morning. We want to thank you for how you bless us in so many ways. And as we give back to you, it's a, a sign that shows that we are trusting in you. And so, Father, bless it and use it for your glory in this place and around the world. And so, Father, as we close our service and song, we pray, Father, that we would indeed lay our lives before you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing King of Kings, Majesty. <laughs>